This podcast is brought to you by The Shift. It's story time! Hello and welcome to the Storytime podcast. And my name is Claire. I go by Clizair on the internet. And this is Storytime with Clizair, the podcast where people tell me their stories. And today I have with me Heidi Tyler. Hello, Heidi. Hello. How are you? Good. How about you? I'm good. So... Before we get into it, would you like to tell people where they can find you on the internet? Well, I'm on Facebook. They can message me on Messenger. I'm also on Instagram at HeidiSC89. And you can find me there if you have questions or I could be of help. Brilliant. So I will put all those links down in the description and on YouTube and in the show notes on the audio platform. So if you're listening or watching, you can just scroll down and click. Um, but Heidi, you have a very interesting and unique story to tell me today. It is a very uh, trauma background, but it is a story with our daughter that you would not want to have anybody live through. It's very traumatic. So, yeah. So, start from the beginning, I guess. Okay. Um, I personally have a very long trauma history. It goes that way back to when I was little. It's specifically related to shootings. My grandfather was a minister and missionary, and when he used to go out to um, visit towns in Mexico, he used to get shot at, and he could hear the bullets fly by. He could, so close, he could hear the whirl. Um, I didn't know that. I know. I know. I didn't know that until my mom told me years later. Um, When I was 10, my dad survived a mass shooting just for stroke of luck. I don't know. Um... It was summertime and my dad, I got up late. So my dad had to take me to where my mom was working. She was a teacher at a different school. And so by the time he dropped me off and got to his university, um, the mass shooting happened. And it was done by a janitor who was disgruntled with his girlfriend. Yeah. Oh my God. If he was sitting in his desk at that university, a bullet would have went straight through. It was right in the wall behind him. His secretary actually was a star witness in that case. And again, I didn't know that till years later because parents being parents protect their kids. And I had to find everything out by myself, but I knew something was wrong. So, um, yeah, those are the two biggest in that background. Um, And I'm originally from California, so a lot of earthquakes. So I can't sleep anyway because any little tick or tremble, I wake up. But the reason we're doing the podcast is um, my daughter was a freshman in high school in 2013. And that was that's the first year of high school here in the state. Yeah. And sorry, I should say here maybe that um, you had written to me. So you'd sent me something in the post and you'd actually written out your story in the letter that you gave me. And I remember contacting you and I was like, if at any point you're willing to share this story on the Internet, I think it's like a really you know, something that might help other people. Um, and you haven't shared this before, haven't you not? Like not um, definitely not publicly like this. And never, never on a public platform because it's, it's so painful. And we're, you know, every day we live, we live through that and we have to deal with that. And so it's to get to a point where I can share it. I'm, you know, thank you for allowing me to be able to do that because I think it'll, it'll help me, but also hopefully help others. But here in Colorado, we've had so many mass shootings and five school shootings specifically since our daughter was born. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's, it started with the Columbine one in 1999 where we lost, uh, what was it? 13 people and then several others. And the last one was a STEM shooting in 2019. And that's, that's right down the road from us in our little area of Denver. Um, but my daughter's shooting was at Arapahoe High School in 12, 13, 13. And she was a freshman in high school. She was on the second floor of, of the, that part of the building in science class. And all of a sudden, they started hearing um, pops. And kids being kids, they thought it was a chemistry student's next door dropping a beaker or exploding something in chemistry class. And... They, you know, the teacher even looked out and no, it's not them. And then it kept going. And so the teachers knew immediately what to do. So they went in lockdown and 
hid and were quiet and everyone was on their cell phones. What happened was um, this student, a senior came in, he had propped the door open and this like your uh, one of your other uh, podcast member uh, guests said it in one of her last podcasts that you don't re- his podcast that you don't realize till years later that all this other extra information because you're on survival mode. Um, so this info came out that he had popped up, propped open the door and he came in that lock, you know, what's supposed to be a locked door and started shooting. He was looking for a specific teacher and uh huh. Oh God. Yeah. And everyone knows this student. And my daughter's also was very acquainted with the student. Um, looking, he was looking for this teacher, didn't, couldn't find the teacher. And he, in the process, he had shot another student in the face. Oh my God. She, uh-huh. And she was also a senior. She asked him, Carl, what are you doing? Like if, to a, stu- to a person who's, who's that elevated with um, intentions, he just, he shot her. And this was right at the bottom of the staircase where he could have easily gone upstairs. And if he went upstairs, the where my daughter was, everyone would have been basically sitting ducks. And so, but he kept going around to look, he went into the library to look for this teacher, couldn't find the teacher. And by that time, the SRO, the school resource officer came in and um, was, he came running and they, at that point they were armed. He had a, he had a weapon on him um, and was looking for the perpetrator. And by the time he got there, Carl had with two Molotov cocktails set the library on fire, went into the back of the library and committed suicide in the back of the library. Oh my God. So he was like, Intending to co- to cause damage because if he not only brought in a gun but like a Molotov cocktails is a you would have had to think about that beforehand. Yeah, he yes, definitely, and that that part we didn't know till months later until the reports came out. Um, we tried to not put it on the TV, but of course it's everywhere because it's it's in our neighborhood, and. In a, in a turn, he this student actually taught or tutored our daughter in Spanish when she was taking Spanish. So she was, she knew him very well. And it it's, yeah, it's not the person that they knew originally. Yeah. It's a totally different person. So she's, she also has to deal with the loss of someone who was like an acquaintance or maybe even a friend and then reckon with what they did as well. So that must be awful hard. It, it was, it's very, it's been very difficult because the, all the things that people have um, done to help these students deal with the tragedy um, was either not aimed at kids in the middle that were friends or acquaintances of this person who came in and did this. So these kids are not only dealing with the loss and the, and the event itself, they're dealing with the loss of a friend and someone they knew. So they're stuck in between and nothing has been put out there to help these kids because you have to deal with what they did, like you said, and then the event itself. So it's been very difficult. Yeah. I can't imagine, you know, how scary that must've been for your daughter. So I presume she's upstairs and they're like locked down and you just have to wait until you get the all clear to come out. And I can't imagine how scary that must have been for her. For you as her mom, like you you mentioned they were all on their cell phones. So was she messaging you? Like, did you know as as it was happening or did you find out later? As it was happening, the first call call I got was my daughter was a swimmer at that point in time. And uh, I got a call on my cell phone from another swim mom. And she was asking me what's going on. I said, I did it because at that point I didn't know anything was going on. And then, so and I got off the phone with her and then my daughter, Marissa, started texting and said, mom, something's going on. There's a shooter. I said, oh, oh, oh God, I, I, you know, you don't know how to react. The first thing that popped into my mind was tell her, I love you because we don't know if that's, a, I didn't know if that's the last time I was going to talk to her or see her. And if anything, if that was the last thing I wanted her to know that I loved her. Um, 
but also at that high school, they, they are very um, integrated, related with the um, Northern Arapaho tribe here in the States. And so they have a very close relationship with the tribe. And the saying that we have at that school is warriors always take care of each other. And so I told her that also, because I knew that the tribe would be coming down, they would be doing something. And so I kept texting her and texting her and she texted back until her phone died. And so by the time her phone died, um, I didn't know where she was because the last text I got, she said they were taking her on a bus to this middle school. They were evacuating. But later I found out the process was she was she and her science teacher and all the students were stuck in that classroom. And when someone breaks, you know, pounds a door, we're taught as teachers and that you don't open the door, you don't say anything, you don't do anything and you don't make a noise, but the SWAT team had to break down the door to evacuate the kids. They had to evacuate with their hands up on their head. Oh because my they, gosh. At, at this point, they didn't know who, um, who was involved. So they had to search all these kids and they evacuated them to the um, track, the track, the field, um, right outside that building. And so that's where they searched the kids, they evacuated them, the teachers kept the group together. Um, the teachers were, her teacher, we still to this day have a very close relationship with, and she comes to her graduations, and it's, she saved their lives, because we didn't, we didn't know, but because the teachers at that school did what they did, we have so many, our kids are alive, because of those teachers. That so, sounds like such a scary experience, both for you and your daughter. It, 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 the worst thing that ever happened. I mean, no one ever wants this to happen. No one ever believes it'll happen, but it does. And me as a teacher, myself in a different district, I know what the teachers do. I know what they are trained to do. So it, it's, it's difficult. You know, oh, wow. Yeah. So you're a teacher yourself. So like, I presume you were at work at the time. You probably, and so there would have been that double thing of you sort of mm -hmm. finding that out at work and trying to navigate that. I'm sure there might've been, uh, if, if word had started to spread, there may have been like a little bit of panic in your school as well, presumably. Uh, there, well, actually that particular day, it was a Friday before their finals week. And um, so at our school on Fridays, they got out at noon. So I started getting um, texts um, probably about 12, 15-ish. Okay. And as soon as I got those texts from my daughter, I ran down the hall to the principal, which is the director of the school, asking her for more information, what's going on. And then she tried to find out through her channels. And she said, yes, there's something going on. So then I ran out of her office to my classroom grabbed my things and ran out of the building but with PTSD this trauma I have a blank space I can't remember how I from when I left that door in the building to there's a gap between that point and the middle of the freeway where I'm trying to drive and figure out how to, how do I get to where she said she is there's no there's no memory in that space wow I just, yeah, it's, it's, I, that there's a gap there. And what I came to, you know, I came, okay, I'm on the freeway trying to figure out where to park and where to drive to get to her. And then from that point, I have no memory from that point until I actually got to the middle school to, where she supposedly was. She wasn't there. We were there waiting and waiting because that was the last text we got from her. And all these kids are come being reunited with their parents by the, by the police officers. And she wasn't there, but luckily there was another swim mom at that middle school. And she texted her daughter, which was she, her daughter was at another place they evacuated students to. And she asked Jordan, is Marissa there? And Jordan says, yes. So then we take off. I have no memory from when I got there to when I parked near the school so there there's there's gaps and I don't think I will ever figure out during you know what 
losing that time because my brain was on. Yeah, you know, might, might, yeah. I was gonna say it might be like a coping mechanism. I'd say it was such a stressful situation. Right, right. And she is my only child. She's a daughter to to boot, and so she's she's. We have a very, we were very close to begin with. Yeah. And so now it's it's. I, I couldn't live without her. She she's the most amazing, resilient person. Um, but when I part and then this is at a high school in, in very large main streets and sits at the corner of very large main streets. So I had to park like three, four streets down. And normally you cannot walk on that street, but they had, there were so many police officers, so many sheriffs, FBI, ATF, um, all these agencies were there with their cars I have never seen anything like it and wow. you know that is nothing I don't want to see that ever again because so many emergency responders but I was parked the car I was running down the middle of the street trying to get to the church where she was at and by the time I got there it's like five hours later after the original first text and so then I felt guilty about why did it take so long for me to find her? I, I We didn't know where she was for like five hours. And so when I wa walked into the church, there's all these, the queue that where parents originally were is totally empty. And they had all these tissue boxes. And so I walked into the gym where the remaining students were and they asked me, who's your student? And then I see her coming. And then the reason, yeah, crying, yeah. hugging, never wanting to let her go. I didn't care who was around. The cops were all around. Um, didn't let her go. Yeah. You didn't let her go, and we didn't. I just, all right. I just, are you okay? Mom is here. I, we're we're together. And so it, it's. It's a response that I don't want any other parent to ever have to go through. So, um, yeah. And just hearing you go through your story as well, it kind of strikes me that it must be, you know, communicating with the parents must sort of almost take a backseat because they weren't like telling you immediately where everyone was going. They're so focused on maybe getting them to safety that they didn't e efficiently communicate to you where they were taking her. And so, but that would have made it worse, presumably, you know, would have really, cause you were panicking about where she was and you couldn't get through to her directly. Right. Right. Because at that point, everyone, everyone had, when they evacuated the, the classrooms, they left everything, their backpacks their laptops. If it wasn't on their person, it stayed in that classroom for over, oh my gosh, over a week. And so if they had their cell phones on them, those were the kids that used their phones. And if their friends' phones died or they didn't have, they left their phones in their backpack, they had no way to communicate with parents. So everyone was sharing cell phones and allowing the other students to communicate with their parents. Um, so in that way, it, it helped other kids communicate with their parents. But we received no communication from the school because they couldn't. We received the communication from our, our own students, our own kids. And so we didn't know where she was. And that's why the scramble. And so you mentioned a week there. So is that the period of time like they take to sort of figure out what happened? Is that were they off school for a week? They were off school for a week. They, um, they canceled finals. They made finals optional for students. Um, they didn't take if students elected. I don't know any student that elected to take a final. Um, so they allowed the students to keep the grades that they had at that point in time. And honestly, if, if our daughter had F's, we would have elected to keep the F's because they were in no way ready to take these exams for these classes. Um, but they used that week to uh, investigate interior and exterior of the buildings. They, um, all the details. They swept the school literally of you know, evidence and things. Um, they cleaned the school as much as they could. They cordoned off the library. Um, the library, Marissa said, it, 
we were allowed to, she was allowed to go back a week later to re retrieve her things. Um, even at that point, I couldn't be without her. I, I took the week off obviously, because I, you know, I can't, I'm not leaving her alone because I didn't know where she was for five hours. I'm not leaving her alone at any point in time, if I could ever get away with that again. So I walked in with her. I stayed in the cafeteria while she went to the classroom to get her things. And she said, mom, everything is exactly like it was when we left it in the room. But looking at the library, it was all burnt. They tried to coordinate it off with um, like a film. So you can't actually see clearly. It's like the, it's like the blurry background filters on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they couldn't see in, but they all knew what happened. And so little bits of information starts coming in here and there. Um, and at that point, it was Christmas break. So students were off for two, three more weeks. And after two, three more weeks, we come back from vacation. The kids come back. School still hasn't started. Um, they had a special ceremony with the Arapaho tribe. They all brought all the elders, the chief, the family members came down to the school and they had a ceremony just for students and staff. No parents, nobody else is allowed. And it was a healing ceremony. And um, they, again, right after the event, they came down, a small group came down and they saged the school inside and out in every corner to get rid of the evil spirits. And that, in our mind, that really helped because of the close relationship that the Arapaho people have with the students, we're a family. And again, like the saying said, we take care of each other. So they came down to do that and they did it twice. And then they did it again, right before the healing ceremony, every nook and cranny and part of the school. And they danced, they had the healing dance with the kids and spoke with the kids. And I think that really helped in a way. Yeah, because I was going to ask, was it really hard for Marissa to go back? It, it was, but it was her high school. Um, where else is she going to go? I mean, you don't, it's, it's home. It's the place that she's known. Because when she was swimming, she used to compete there at independent swim meets. And so she knows that school very, very well. And there was no way she would be able to go to a different school. Oh, of course. Yeah, it's such a big part of your life, your your secondary school. Exactly, exactly. And, she, at, you know, at that point, she loved the school. She loved, um, it, it was her home. And she couldn't think of going anywhere else because at this point, everything, everything changed, Claire, everything. Um, it really showed us what was important in life and you know before it was you would get busy with work or this activity or that activity and no now the most important thing is time with family because yeah. we don't know family and friends and you find out who your real family is it doesn't matter if you're a blood relative or a friend it's the responses we got from other people shock um dismay it, it it, it, we had all the, all the responses that you can imagine, um, but we had to be together. And how have you guys and like the community as a whole healed since? Like, um, it's it's for personally, all of my husband. He was the. I don't know how he came out of it. How he has he he's the kind of the overseer that. He took care of us. He made sure we had things to eat. He um, he was doesn't seem as affected as we are because as a mom, this is my only child, and it's a girl. It's we're we're extremely close, and yeah. um, so I, for three weeks, I, right after that, I hold held her hand. I always had my arm around her. I wouldn't let her go. Um, I slept on the floor in her bedroom for weeks because she was afraid and I didn't want to let her out of my sight. And for to hold 
the hand of a 14 year old teenager in the middle of stores is it's not something that's yeah, oh, not gosh, something they mom. normally let you do <laughs> right right just like mom leave me alone go away yeah. um but no it's you know and we always wore our Arapaho shirts and people in the stores just at, at first they were even young kids came up to us in the Starbucks we're praying for you we're hoping you're okay We'd go out to breakfast. Older people would say, "We're praying for you." You know, we, you know, thinking about you. But that was the immediate response. And later on, you know, years later, because this has been seven, seven and a half years now, and I've had people at work, principals, directors, tell me, "Isn't it about time you got over it?" And so when you don't say that to people that are going through any kind of trauma. And especially this one with your child, you, you don't say that because it compounds it and makes it worse. And it, it's yeah, a, I mean, I totally agree. Like if you've gone through something like that, people just until you go through it, you probably can't really understand the magnitude of it. And it's definitely not something that you can just get over, not even in a longer period of time. So, yeah, unfortunately, right. that's unfortunate. Right. One of the things that um, has helped is uh, I joined a, the Rebels Project. It's a um, Facebook group, and it's for people of mass um, who have experienced mass violence, specifically school shootings. It was started by people that went to um, Columbine. And so, the, I, and actually that brings up a good point because right after, right after it happened, the first people that come over were people from Columbine. And literally, yeah, it's, they are just miles away. And so they came over and they were there for the kids. They were there for the families. We had um, ceremonies outside the school because we can't go in the school yet. Uh, people from all over that ex have experienced these mass violence events have came and made themselves available to talk to, to help us help the kids uh, we receive a lot of um, therapy dogs people with therapy dogs came wow. from across the country mm -hmm. and animals like you know with Millie um, they lift our spirits and they are so they know when something's wrong and our cats at the time would not leave our side they knew something was wrong so they were there for us to hold them cuddle them and you know, so those people that we don't know came out to help us. And so I'm hoping that some way this podcast may be able to help others because another part in our healing is here in Colorado, it, it's my daughter will never come back and live in Colorado. Never, never. Um, she hates it here. She hates what happens. She says that oh, crazies come to Colorado, and it, it's she's right because we've had five mass school shootings. The last one was at Highlands Ranch, and right before the Highlands Ranch one happened, some lady, some actually she was young, she was maybe eighteen, came from Florida, and the FBI was tracking her, and she wanted to commit a, a school shooting, aka Columbine style. And so they were tracking her the whole time, but because they were tracking her, they alerted all the school districts and the school districts had shut down. And people, because they knew this person was in the area and wanted to do something, but- It's so scary. It, it was, it was. At least, we were, at least they were on top of it, like they knew they were following her, but God. Right, right. So schools were shut down because they wanted to protect the kids. And I think malls, even at, the, at one point, were closed because, you know, that's the next closest type of target with a lot of people. But they had tracked her up to the mountains and then she had committed suicide up in the mountains. And what I wanted to ask you as well was when something like that, maybe not that specific example, but like you mentioned there was another school shooting. I think you said it was 2019. So like yeah. when that happens, then does that bring up like all this trauma for you again? It, it really does, Claire. It's, it's um, 
it re-triggers and takes me back to the same place, same time. It's the same emotions. Um, and at that point, my daughter had graduated in 2017. At that point, she went off to university. And I, I tell her, don't look at the news. Don't look at the news. But kids these days, they look at the BuzzFeed news. <laughs> she already knew. I said, she don't. She knew don't. already. <laughs> she knew already. I said, don't worry. Mom's okay. Mama's okay. Don't look. Because that was at a school right down the street. It, it was literally right down the street from my therapist's office. Oh, and so yeah. I and, and you're still teaching yourself, aren't you? And I'm still teaching myself. So she's probably keeping on the news anyway. Yeah, and that 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 event specifically brings up multiple factors because a student in I was teaching a student of a friend who was also another teacher, and but that student went to school south of us, but they were in lockdown too, because they don't know the what's going on. They just knew this is a school shooting is happening in the area. So all surrounding schools go in lockdown. And she was telling me that her daughter was in lockdown. I said, oh my God, oh no, we're here for you. I'll run down and go get her. She can stay at our house, whatever she needs to do. But I didn't know at that time that it was down the street from us. And so when I got home, I realized what's going on and it's right down the street from my therapist's office. When another teacher mm -hmm. friend drove home to school, she had to drive through exactly what we went through picking up our students. Um, and, you know, so in later that week, I had an appointment with my therapist and I looked at her and the first thing I said to her, now you understand because they saw everything that we saw. Yeah. And they're starting to see students like I'm seeing her for. Um, and so it, it's, it keeps happening here in Colorado, Claire. It keeps happening. How many times do I have to tell my daughter, call my daughter, text my daughter? And now it's turned around where I was worrying about her and now she's somewhere else worrying about me. How many times? Does this have to happen, especially here in Colorado? It's 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 like a magnet. It keeps happening here, and we don't know why. Yeah, that is so scary because it's not something you can. It's something you can maybe like prepare for in terms of drills, but it's not something you can ever prepare for emotionally or, you know, avoid really because it's so unpredictable. You're, you're right. You're right. And as a teacher, we have to do those drills twice a year, once every semester. And I can't do them anymore. I, I have not been able to do those for a number of years. And when I've asked for help, please just let me know ahead of time so I can prepare my brain somehow. And the last school I was at that I asked for help, they said no. And when we had the drill, I had a... I, I broke down, I couldn't handle it. And when I asked if I could speak to the psychologist, they told me, you're not allowed to speak to them. They're not trained in adults. And I told them, I'm, I don't want therapy from them. I just have a question about who I should, what type of person I should talk to outside of yeah. the school, but I wasn't allowed to. And when I asked, when I filed for ADA accommodations, which are Americans with Disabilities Act for my PTSD and anxiety trauma. Um, they deny those accommodations and they threaten to terminate my contract. So it sounds to me like they're definitely lacking in some supports, especially if this has happened as many times as that, like that there should be some better supports in place for people who are dealing because it is an ongoing thing. It's not, it's not something you can just get over. And You're right. You're right. And, you know, in Denver, in our district, we have, you know, not only adults and families that have dealt with what we've lived through, we have a lot of uh, refugee students that come from God knows what has happened, um, where they see their parents murdered in front of them, um, all kinds of violence, unspeakable violence they come with, even from, with, from within refugee camps. I've asked for, they need to do something for those students and nothing's really been done. So it's a systemic, it's a systemic issue yeah. that um, the mental health services are extremely lacking. 
And we need to not only help our students, we need to help adults just in the community, right? Um, I, I'm not sure why it keeps happening, but thank God for our friends um, that they don't understand but they're willing to love you and stand by you and hold you and just talk to you regardless of what, what it is, what your religious background, your color, whatever, they're willing to be there. And sometimes they're even, they help more than family does in some cases because family can be so far away yeah. and they don't really understand um, or they don't want to talk about it. And that in itself is a trauma too, because you need to be able to, get it out somehow in your own way in your own time well thank you so much for sharing uh your story people won't know this just by watching but because of our time difference it's very early in your morning so you're doing this before work so hope hopefully i have you know it's not too upsetting and you can i haven't ruined your work day basically by <laughs> making you share such a traumatic uh event but i really appreciate you coming on to share it and could you remind everyone where to find you on the internet? And I'll put all the links down in the description as well, in case anyone does have, you know, experience or wants to reach out or wants to talk about this kind of stuff. Right. You can find me. You can message me on Facebook Messenger. Uh, you can get me on Instagram at Heidi SC89. And um, just let me know. I'd be glad to help anybody who needs help or provide advice or just be there to listen. Thank you so much. Thank um, you so much too, Claire. So thank you for watching and or listening. Um, and I shall see you in the next one. Thank you again, Heidi. My pleasure, Claire. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by The Shift. For more like this, check out theshift.ie.